This is the Envision Self-Healing Podcast, episode number four. Hi, I'm Will Fuller. And I'm Richard Miller. And we are the co-creators of EnvisionSelfHealing.com. And we are dedicated to improving eyesight and quality of life by taking healing into your own hands. Today, we're going to be discussing the importance of the shape of your eyeball and the strength of your pupil in having clear vision. And in the second part of the show, we have a question from a colleague of ours in Eastern Europe who writes an email to us asking, number one, what's the difference between macular vision and central vision? And two, wouldn't reading be a, a good shifting exercise? So, Will, how was your week in self-healing? Yeah, I've had a really good week this week. Um, in particular, I want to talk about quite a, a milestone that I experienced, actually, uh, oh, this week. And it came after I was waiting to work on a client. And I was doing some uh, self-massage on the back of my neck and around my eyes and all the stuff that you can find uh, in the massage section on our website. And as I was doing it, I opened my eyes because I wanted to check the time to see when my client was going to be there. And I actually noticed that things seemed a little bit clearer. And uh, I don't even remember, but last week I talked about how I felt I was engaging my left eye All right. that little bit more. Now, those of you who don't know, my left eye is the one that has the, a cataracts and a pseudomacular hole that was created during a boxing injury when I used to coach boxing back in the day. And this is the one eye that I've really been working towards to try and improve uh, vision in this, in this particular eye. And I opened only my left eye because as I said, I've been working um, to engage it a lot more throughout this week. And as I looked at the clock, I actually noticed that my vision seemed a little bit clearer. Now obviously, uh, being where we were, we have eye charts up uh, everywhere. Yeah. True. So I almost didn't uh, believe in this in this extra clarity that I had had, and I looked over to an eye chart, and I realised that from a short distance, um, where this time last year I could only read the top uh, three lines, I could read an extra three lines down. Nice. Just from this uh, clarity and vision. Now again, I just almost couldn't uh, believe it. Yeah. So I went and tested myself from twenty feet. And I've always measured at 2100 right. with my left eye. Right. And I went and tested it, and I even tested it indoors, and it came to 2070. Wow. So for the first time in a year, and that might sound like a long time for a lot of you, um, but you know the fact that this is a condition that's meant to get worse, and in fact, I'm improving it. And it's almost a little reward uh, that you get every now and then, every time you get these little steps forward in your right, vision. Right. And uh, I think what was nice for me is that it, it really caught me uh, off guard. Yeah. Um, and afterwards, I was trying to think, you know, because whenever this happens, it's like, right, how can we tell people to do exactly what I just done? You know, how can we, yeah, yeah. you know, help people, you know, improve their cataracts and, and their vision? So I sort of came down um, to the three things that really what, I've been focusing on uh, over these last couple of months, really, right. uh, and, and of course over the last few years, but in particular these last few months, which was uh, the nutrition that both Richard and I have been really spending a lot of time focusing on with juicing and trying to do research on what nutrients are best for the eye. And the second thing is doing the eye exercises. Um, I've really been putting a lot of effort in with my eye exercises recently. Uh, those of you that listened to last week's episode, I talked about how um, I was sort of bullying myself to do the exercises and to not um, miss the exercises. And the third thing that I th think that really helped um, in this particular case was extra blood flow. Right. And that's what I think the massaging was doing. Um, I've also taken up running again over the last few weeks. So I really think it's not so much just one activity, but it was certainly something that I noticed immediately. But the build-up um, over the last six months has sort of taken me to this place of having the clearer vision in that left eye. And I'm very pleased to say that the, uh, the clarity in that vision has actually stayed since. So nice. um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're going to have a, a, a similar uh, jump in vision 
uh, to talk about Richard. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know this, you know it's it's not um, overly common um, for this to happen all the time, which is why I'm obviously so excited about this improvement. Um, but it does, you know, it's something that you always work towards to see these little improvements every now and then, and to know that your hard work is paying off, which is always. Well, and, and really your alternative to improving this cataract is surgery, which you don't want to do, so. Exactly. So it's, it's really a case of uh, trying your best and, as, and try and do the exercises that you can do um, to avoid the surgery and try and help it naturally. Yeah, exactly. Well, my week was interesting too. I, um, as often people do, my job uh, and all my activities get in the way of doing eye exercises. And I found myself mainly doing eye exercises when I was treating clients and doing them at the same time, which is a very good thing in our profession that we yeah. get to do this. We're kind of lucky that way. Yeah, we get to actually um, help um, someone else and our eyes get better at the same moment. Um, so. Unless we're sitting in front of the computer writing about it. Exactly, and that's, that's <laughs> the opposite of helping our eyes, but, yeah. uh, which we do a lot of that as well. So I finally realized I've got to knuckle down and start doing some more eye exercises <laughs> again. So I, I did spend a few days uh, palming for mm, up to half an hour to 45 minutes a day nice. and sunning again it's probably the same amount it was a nice sunny weekend did a lot of sunning over the weekend and the other thing I did was I started I had these uh, uh, presbyopia I'm, I'm working right now on my presbyopia so I had this presbyopia chart okay. that ironically it was so silly of me but I had this eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper and it just occurred to me to fold the paper up this time and <laughs> shove it in my pocket as opposed to carrying around this big flat piece of paper. Right. So now I'm on uh, BART, which I do frequently, mm -hmm. and now I can t take out this folded piece of paper. Ah. Isn't it brilliant? Yeah, right? genius. Genius. <laughs> and, and only look at one part of the chart and do that chart. And it's much less conspicuous for one thing, and I don't have to carry it. It's easy to carry around. I can crumple it up. It's it's. So that was one thing I discovered. Excellent. And the other thing I discovered was from our own video mm -hmm. of holding up the two fingers. Oh, the convergent <laughs> side exercise video. Right. And instead of having to use the chart, so I don't even have to take the chart out of my paper, out of my pocket anymore. Mm -hmm. I hold up the two fingers, converge my eyes, create a third finger in the middle. And I was able to do that easily again on trains and stuff like that. So I'm using up my spare time to still do the convergence of the muscles. Excellent. Um, and that's, that's something that we're really trying to encourage our listeners and anyone that's uh, been on our website is to try and do what Richard is doing is to learn to incorporate these exercises into your life. And, and by no means, you know, are we your uh, be, all, be all and end all. It's a case of you trying these things out yourself on public transport or at work or whatever. And see if you can come up with things like what Richard's just described. Yeah, the two finger thing. Well, the other thing I discovered, I don't think this is even in the video, maybe it is. Oh, um, well, it's an exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, listening. I noticed that I could converge my eyes and then move my fingers back and forth closer and farther. Ah, and yeah. And it meant the good. muscles were like doing little push ups. Wow. And if I could and I could maintain the third finger clearly and move them foot farther and, and closer together. And could you actually feel the muscles in the eye yeah. working? Yeah. It's a strange experience. Isn't yeah. It? <laughs> there is a point where they get so far apart that I that the the third image breaks right. apart. So those of you that um aren't quite getting what we're talking about here, you can see our uh, convergence video uh, right. on our website. Um but just as as Richard's explaining, holding up the two fingers and moving them apart um, it's really a good way to be able to do the convergence, which helps presbyopia. Right. And then the, t the final test was today when we, we did a, uh, a webinar, and I was setting up the video camera for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, don't, don't panic. Okay. <laughs> I, I did not use my magnifier to set up the video camera. Wow. I actually read the menu with my naked eyes. So, wow. So uh, is that why nobody could see us? That's right. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> and maybe I was misinterpreting what it was yeah. saying on the menus. No, I'm joking. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it was. That is great. But it took some courage, actually, to not take out my magnifier. Yeah, it's a habit, isn't it? Yeah. To see, oh, I really can read those letters. And actually trying to use your own vision instead of going straight 
for the magnifier. Right. I know when I'm on the computer, for some reason, habitually, I lean. If it's a small text or something, I lean my body in first. Right. Yeah. Before I even try and read it, I just lean straight in. Exactly. Um, so it's really, it's a really good uh, observation that you're starting to break those patterns. And the fact that you were able to actually see as well without the magnifying glass is a, is a massive improvement. Right. Well, and I've also noticed I'm taking out my iPhone and I'm holding it a good two uh, inches farther away uh-huh. because my eyes are working together now. Uh, as opposed to, I tend to use my only my right eye and then bring it in close. Um, by doing the convergence exercise, I'm engaging both my eyes. And now I can hold it and use both hold it further away and use both eyes and it's clearer. Ah. So, yeah. so maybe that's something I should be looking at trying to do as well to get both my eyes working exactly, together is yeah. uh, a few more convergence eye exercises. Right. I know I'd, for my convergence exercises, I look at the tip of my nose. Ah. Um, but that does, that works them pretty hard. It does. So I don't, I don't, I don't advise that for an vision improvement novice. No. Um, and don't do it for too long. Try the, fin- um, try the two fingers first. Yeah, and definitely don't do it while you're walking down the street because um, you probably will walk into a lamppost. Yeah. Um, but that's that's certainly another thing that you can do uh, if you're just on the bus or, or whatever. It's a very convenient thing where you can just look at the tip of your nose for the convergence. So let's get on with the topic of the week. So the first part of our topic is uh, talking about how the shape of your eyeball can improve your vision or how it affects your vision to begin with, shall we say. Okay. Um, and the first thing to know is that the eyeball is supposed to be spherical. Uh, it, it grows from, uh, from birth to about age 20. It grows about 7 millimeters uh, from in, in your teenage years. And um, when we, in our modern life, we are spending an awful lot of time, most of our time really, looking at close objects, looking at nearby objects. And uh, the eye adapts to this uh, activity, to the predominance of this activity, the constant looking from near, it adapts by actually becoming elongated, becoming non-spherical. It loses its spherical shape and becomes longer from front to back. And um, what happens then is that near objects are focused on the retina without doing anything. It's, it's the, the eyeball becomes longer and that puts close objects right on the retina and h- hence the name nearsightedness because your eye has now adapted its shape to focus, well not focus, to be completely focused on near objects. Um, and by doing that elongation now distance objects are blurry. Um, so, so kind of just the opposite of someone who's farsighted. Exactly. So it means they're farsighted so they can see in the distance, but they find it difficult to see from near. And uh, we're not really going to discuss it today, but the, the eyeball there in that case is then a shorter eyeball instead of a longer eyeball. So it's just the opposite. Right. So um, nearsightedness, if you think about the cause that we've described now, that nearsightedness is caused by looking near all the time, and and you think about it, when do people get glasses? They get glasses somewhere around first to third grade, usually, when uh, children have been put in school and they are looking near all the time, and suddenly their eyeball starts to elongate, and now they need prescription glasses to deal with that, Mm -hmm. the nearsightedness. Yeah. So that's the, the cause, the, the modern uh, lifestyle cause of nearsightedness. Um, and of course that extends all the way through college and then our, in our work environment, we're all looking near all the time. And if you think about how we used to function before um, common literacy and before books and what have you, which really isn't that long ago, we used to spend most of our early years growing up um, just being outside playing and you know being out and around and, and either if you think even further back even if you were working you would be working outside in the fields or right. not in a you know in a close environment even if you weren't inside studying if you think about the size of the room that you're sitting in now it's really not any more than six foot 15 feet 
if you're lucky. So it means that the world around you is always from near and never from far. And even socializing, which we all enjoy, is looking from near as well. So Yeah, I mean, it's so important to be able to pick up on people's um, facial expressions and you know I see Richard sitting here now giving me a big smile and uh, and, I, and I know that he likes me well yeah. <laughs> I'm good at I'm good at thinking <laughs> yeah 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 he took a class in uh, facial expressions yeah uh, thinking all right so the the solution to this is very obvious at this point is like do the opposite of what caused your problem which is looking into the distance and uh, the Two solutions we have for that are looking farther than you're looking now. So if you're working on a computer or in a classroom, at least look as far as you can, can within the room. Um, 20 feet would be wonderful, but even something approaching that would be good. And the second solution is to actually go outside or look through a window very far away, say 100 feet or more, and uh, look into distance that way. So uh, the second topic we were going to deal with to this podcast was the uh, strength of the pupil. And um, why don't you describe the, the muscles in the pupil? Well, there's, um, it's, we have to clarify here for our listeners. The, the pupil is the black hole. Uh, people say that the eyes are the window to the soul. And you could think of the pupil as being that opening. Um, it's also... If you ever, if someone ever gets red eye in a picture, right. um, that red eye is actually the back of the retina right. um, that you're actually getting with the flash. So this, it's a natural physical hole um, that leads to the back of the eye, which allows uh, light and images to reach the back of the eye. So the eye is amazing in the sense that it is able to control the amount of light that comes in through that hole and it does it by making the hole either larger or smaller and the way that's done is through the muscles in the iris most of us know what the iris is it's the colored part of the eye that we can see not the white part um but the you know the, the brown eyed girls or the uh right. you know the, the blue eyes that you see and that actually consists of two muscles and one muscle is responsible for constricting the pupil and making it smaller and the other muscle when it contracts it actually dilates the pupil and creates more uh, area for the light to come through. Now the importance of understanding this is it allows us to understand how we're going to improve it and what it is that we're doing wrong in the first place um, that's inhibiting this uh, amazing function to happen. So when we constrict and uh, the muscles constrict and it makes a smaller hole. This enables us to function freely when we're outside instead of it being a blinding light. Now unfortunately a lot of us uh, wear sunglasses a lot of the time, uh, not, not even outdoors. Right, so I people, see them indoors all the time. They want to look cool so they're wearing yeah. them indoors. <laughs> I've even seen people in bars before wearing sunglasses. Yeah. I can never yeah. figure out how they can see anything. Um, so, but what's happening is the muscle that is normally used to constrict to prevent the light from uh, hurt, you know, hurting the eyes and straining you to see in the sunlight is not being used anymore and that natural ability to constrict is being weakened. Right. Another benefit of the constriction is it allows you to see finer detail. Right. So part of what Rich is doing with his presbyopia exercises is to help uh, constrict the uh, the muscle that's responsible for doing that and it helps strengthen that muscle All right so i'm sunning as a way of shrinking my pupils which creates it just channels the light straightens out the light rays essentially and so they hit the retina in a sharp way uh, so a, sh a smaller pupil gives you a sharper image projected onto the back of your eye and the part of the back of the eye, which is what we're going to discuss in our next question, yeah. uh, that it's really targeting is the fovea or the macula, which is the most detailed part of our vision. Right. So it's really um, giving that focus. Just like if you were to wear pinhole glasses, uh, if you've never seen pinhole glasses, you can check out our website at envisionselfhealing.com. Go to the resources section and look for, uh, they look like a pair of sunglasses and we call them pinhole glasses. 
And uh, what these do is they do exactly the same, except you can use them indoors or you know wherever. And a lot of people find that when they look at a sheet of paper of text and they put the pinholes on, the image actually comes out clearer. And that's because of the same phenomena that we're getting with the pupil in the sense that it's focusing the image on the back of the eye. So two really crucial things there that constricting the pupil do. Uh, something that none of us even realize is going on right, right. throughout our, our daily lives. Yeah. Um, and maybe for good reason. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe if you were walking around thinking, oh, my pupil's constricting now. Right. Um, then maybe it might be difficult to function at work. Well, I guess the point where you would really realize is if you're walking out of a movie theater or something into a bright daylight, yeah. you suddenly you are blinded by the light. And it, it, just think about your pupil, rather than grabbing for your sunglasses, think, oh, if I had a stronger uh, constrictor muscle in my pupil, or in my iris, essentially, then my eyes would close down more quickly and I wouldn't be so blinded at this moment. So one thing we want to do for this um, is, a, is an exercise called sunning, uh, which again, you can find out more details of that on our website. But what that's doing is it's continuously constricting and dilating the pupil, and it allows the muscles of the iris uh, to be strengthened and to become more flexible, and it makes it easier to use uh, during the day right. and um, you know, in sunny environments or whatever. So just like Richard uh, explained there with the cinema example, is the complete opposite also happens. So where our pupil constricts to reduce the amount of light, when we're in a dark environment... Like, movie, like a movie theater. Like a movie theater. Yeah. Perfect, yes. Uh, unless you're watching a movie about the sun. <laughs> <laughs> I've not seen one of those for a while. Yeah. Um, so if it's dark in the movie theater, then the pupil is uh, going to dilate and those muscles in the iris responsible for creating more space and more room, um, they contract and they pull the iris back and it means you can actually take in more light into the back of your eye and it means that you can see more in a dark environment. And part of the reason you may be having trouble in dark environment is the weakness of this muscle. Exactly. And it's also uh, greatly involved in peripheral vision. Right. So this is something that I've been focusing on myself with retinitis pigmentosa is how can I increase my periphery? So if the muscles that are responsible for dilating the pupil are weak, then I'm limiting the amount of peripheral vision that I'm actually getting by not having that. And also if I'm in a dark environment and RP is notorious for things like night blindness, then being able to take in more light is obviously advantageous uh, for me and for right. anyone that wants to see more right. in the dark. And uh, just like Richard said, a great example is coming out of the uh, movies. Another thing is to maybe sit in a room and palm uh, for like five minutes and then you can either turn all the lights off, notice how dark it is in the room, palm for five minutes and then take your hands away and notice if the room is any brighter. And if it is, then that shows that your uh, pupil is dilating. You can also, I don't know, quickly, quickly uh, flash a mirror in front of you and you'll be able to see that your oh, pupil yeah, yeah. is dilated sure. and turn the light on. Yeah. So but you also know, because when you turn the lights on in the room, it's going to sort of hurt the eyes a bit. And that's because, one, that the, the, the lighting in your house is pretty horrible for natural eyesight. <laughs> and the second one is that pupils are dilated and all that excess light is getting into the eye, so it's constricting that pupil as much as possible to try and restrict the amount of light that's coming into the eyes. So the formal exercise we just talked about is called palming, and again, you can find that on our website. And we would recommend that as an exercise for uh, dilating your pupils, getting that dilator muscle stronger. Um, the other thing we would recommend is, as he said, sitting in a dark room. Okay, well, uh, certainly a lot of information there. Um, we wish we had a bit, a bit more time to go through it all. Um, and certainly the people that are on our webinar at the moment were able to get access to a little bit more information on that. But you could always read up a little bit more about yourself or head over to our website and we've uh, written quite a bit of it up in more detail. So I think it's about a good time to move to question of the week. question is, 
Uh, what is the difference between central vision and macular vision? Um, the second part of that question is, wouldn't reading be a good shifting exercise? And there are related questions. So the answer to the first one is very easy. Uh, the macula is the central part of the retina that is made up of cones rather than rods, which form the periphery of the retina. Um, and the cones see color and fine detail, uh, and they make up our sharp central vision. You'll also find, if you look at a picture of the macula, that a lot of the cones that are responsible for that central vision are tightly packed. Right. And they're sort of on top of each other. And this is because this is the most dense area where you're actually going to find cones in the eye, and it's the cones that are responsible for that fine detail and color. Right. So, um, in my opinion then, the macular vision and central vision are really the same thing. Yeah, you could just, uh, just bear in mind that maybe the, the macula is certainly the 1%. The it's, it's made up, you know, it's the finer part of the central vision that's really responsible for that fine, fine detail. Right. But central vision may be just sort of a general term that people use. Too, yeah. So. so when, and the, the reason why the question came up was to do with our ebook. Uh, where she said that we talk about how we underuse our macula, oh, right. but we overuse our central vision. Right. So the thing is, is the macula is what's responsible for seeing the fine detail. So you might be using your central vision, which is opposed to peripheral vision. So you've got central vision versus peripheral vision, but then you've also got uh, the macula, which is part of the central vision, which is responsible for that real fine detail. So you could overwork your central vision because if you switch off your periphery and you spend 18 uh, hours a day you know, reading books, reading uh, on your laptop, you're always using your central vision. Right. Now the macula is the detailed part of the central vision. Right, okay. So, so even though you're overusing your central vision or you're using your central vision all the time, you're not necessarily activating those cone cells, the cells responsible for the fine detail, because you're not looking for detail. Right, so explain then how reading is not, this gets to the second part of the question. Oh, yeah. How is reading not looking at details? So when we look at a book, we really, um, and even scarier now is, is people try and do speed reading. So they try right. and read a whole page at a time. It's like, open up the page, I don't even know how they do it. I don't know. Um, so, but even if uh, the common day person, we tend to read, you know, four or five words at a time or a sentence at a time. So that's just taking in uh, block information. Now, when we talk about details, we're talking about the shape of the letters. We're talking about the contrast of the black uh, ink versus the white page. Right. Or well, say you're looking at the letter T. And you know how many corners does the T have? How many straight lines does it have? Now, obviously, it would take you you know forever to read a Stephen yeah. King book or, yeah. or the Harry Potter books um, <laughs> if you read every letter in this detail. Right. But this is our point: is that you know we don't look in that much detail. Right. So in general, you are going to be reading in your life, and in that case, you're using your central vision, uh, and you're probably overusing your central vision given our modern lifestyle. Mm -hmm. But then you can compensate by that in two ways. You can block your central vision and stimulate the periphery, and that uh, relieves some of the stress on the central vision. So that's taking away from the issue of overusing your central vision. Mm -hmm. Now you want to actually use the macula, let's say, yeah. instead of calling it the central vision. You're right to, to distinguish those two that way, yeah. actually. And for that, you want to do the exercise shifting, uh, which you can find uh, more on our website where we go into a lot more detail and how, in fact, shifting is so beneficial and how that was our natural way. But we are going to be covering that over the next few weeks, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, so oh, that's, a, that's a good distinction to make, actually. <laughs> now, that I've, now that I take it back, the central vision and the macula are not the same. Let's <laughs> distinguish them now and say we overuse our central vision yeah. by looking at books and computers and ignoring the periphery, and we underuse our macula. I like this distinction. Yeah, I'm glad I fought my corner there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> by um, not looking at details. Exactly. So, oh, that's perfect.
Okay, so uh, certainly a lot of uh, food for thought there, and uh, we're glad that you got to hear a live debate there um, <laughs> over uh, central vision versus macular versus peripheral, and I hope it wasn't too much for you. So um, you can always find out a lot more uh, about our exercises and the work that we're trying to do at envisionselfhealing.com. As I said previously, we love to hear from you guys, and we love answering your questions because there's a good chance that if you've got a question, then a couple of thousand other people have the same question as well. So we also like getting uh, great feedback from you guys on our blogs and on our podcasts, and surely head over to our Facebook fan page, and if you like our page, you get access to our wall, where we've got a lot of our questions there, and also a little bit about what we do in our daily vision improvement lives, uh, a little bit more interactive that way. I'm really glad that we can uh, use that wall in yeah. that way yeah. and both Richard and I have our personal Twitter accounts where um, again uh, we try and inform you as much as possible on, on how we're improving our site and also giving general tips on vision improvement itself so I hope you enjoyed this podcast and look forward to seeing you next week bye <laughs>